Hi, it's Tim and welcome back to the corner. Last time we started playing with a one wire temperature probe attached to the C64 user port. In today's video, we're continuing from where we left off, adapting the program to save our temperature results to a disk file. And then we're going to look at some I squared C devices. Yes, I squared C on the Commodore 64. We'll also look at ways to measure temperature through the joystick ports and stay to the end for some fun with some LEDs. Now, let's get started. If you haven't seen the previous video, there's a link in the corner and in the description. Briefly, we hooked up a DS18B20 sensor to the user port and we read it with code provided by fellow YouTuber Yosip's RetroBits. Now let's make some changes. So something that we can do. I don't think that reading temperatures on the whole is a particularly time critical operation. So the fact that we're doing all this in basic doesn't really affect things. Doesn't really matter. We don't need to be an assembler for this because 10 times a second versus seven times a second versus 12, 13, 14, 15 times a second, whatever, doesn't really make a difference. And if it is important that you are getting um, that sort of frequency of temperature readings, then probably a C64 is not your machine of choice. So let's slow this right down. And let's say we're gonna take a temperature reading every 10 seconds. So 930. Let's wait for Okay, so we're going to sit here and we're going to wait until the final character of TI dollar is a zero. And then we're going to go back to 10 and um, do the user thing again. So hopefully this will take a temperature reading every 10 seconds. Current time. Okay, and that's too slow. It's obviously missing something, so let's just make that a hundred. Okay, and that's too fast because we then got three hits. That's obviously a failed reading. And that's just inaccurate because it's actually still around 26. So I would guess that that failed the CRC check, maybe. But we can see and if I set that to one shot that is basically the transaction that um, reads the temperature. So now because we are in basic and we have got the time and the temperature value, we can do other things with that quite happily. We can store it on floppy. We can print it. We can draw a nice graph. We can do all sorts of stuff, anything we like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little routine to this program that is going to write the temperatures to disk in just a sequential file. And we only need two values. We need the time and the temperature. And then at a later time, we can write another program that reads those in. And over the period of a day, for example, it will plot the entire temperatures of this office, which might be interesting to see, I think. 10 second intervals, maybe, uh, maybe a minute interval. 
whatever do you think is going to be a useful period of um, getting values. Anyway, that is now doing something a little more interesting, I think, with this thermometer. I'd like to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this video. PCBWay have made the circuit board that we are using today. This is a uh, prototype board for the Commodore 64 user port. They come in packs of 10. They're a shared project and you can get them from the shared project library. I've got mine in yellow. You can get them in any color you like. Green, blue, red, yellow, um, purple, black, white. And they will cost you $5 for a pack of 10. Ordering them is very, very simple. You just go to the website, go to the shared projects page and fill in the details of exactly what you want. $5 plus shipping, www.pcbway.com. Details are in the description. Back at the C64, I've made a certain number of changes to the basic program as well. I've increased its size dramatically. I've added some uh, usability stuff and let's have a a look. You see it's a lot longer than it was now so let's just take a look at it in chunks. So the first bit I keep reaching for a mouse to try and wiggle the mouse over it. Initial thing if A equals 1 go to 60 that's just jumping over the load routine and the first time through we just print some nice little messages on here. It takes readings every 10 seconds and then I've got to press F7 to exit because we want to be able to finish it uh, without just hitting run stop and I'll explain why in a moment. So load ds18b20.bin as before. Now here's a new bit. We are opening a sequential file to log the data. So first off we open a command channel 15,8,15 so that we can look at any errors and then we are going to open our sequential file open 2 comma 8 comma 2 comma 1 wire data comma seq comma write and then we go sub 10,000 so 10,000 is my error checking routine and the first error that it's going to come across and the reason it's going to come across this is because I've done it before. The first error that it's going to come across is an error 63, which is file exists. Because I've already run this program and when it tries to open it for a write, it's going to fail. So I say if D is greater than 20, D E is my value that I've read from the disk error channel. D E stands for disk error. Close to open 2, 8, 1, 1 wire data comma seq comma append so this is just going to add new data onto the end of the existing file that way if we stop if we crash or something we can just keep going and going and if we want to start a new one then we just delete that file so let's just have a quick look at line 10,000 so it's a very simple error check so we get our data from the error channel input hash 15 d comma d dollar comma dt comma ds because this is a 1541 then we don't have a dd and a dd of course would be the drive number so drive zero or drive one which you would get on a pet dual drive so if d is less than 20 or de is 63 then we just return 63 is our file exists and we don't want to throw up a disk warning with, with file exists because that's going to mean people will think oh, 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 oh. and we don't want that. So it's basically going to ignore a file exists because we handle that higher up. Otherwise we say um, there's been an error. So 100 to 200 this is Pretty much as it was before, we poke 785 and 786 with our address C000 and we call our user 0 and get the result in T%. Percent. Now I've added this EC% percent variable which I've set to 0 and the reason for this is simply so that I can count the number of times it fails the CRC check. Why? Because I'm curious. No other reason really. So for the CRC check, 
If you remember, we um, put the number in FC and uh, it was zero or one if there was an error. So for the error check, we peak 252. And if it's greater than zero, then we go back to 130 and we call it again. If it's zero, then we go on and we do our calculation to get the decimal point back and round it down to one place of decimals. Then we display the result on the screen and also we print it to our sequential file. Print hash to current time and the value of the error, or oh, sorry, the value of the temperature. Go sub 10,000, that checks for an error. If DS is greater than 20, then we go to 900. And we'll see what that is in a moment. And if DS is zero, then what we're going to do is we're going to go down here, we're going to check for a key press, and we're going to wait for our 10 seconds and then go and take the next reading. For I equals one to 100, do a key check. And this thing here is the F7 key. If we get an F7, then we go to 900. 900 again, I'm sure you're guessing what is a 900. Otherwise, if right dollar of ti dollar comma one is zero, i.e. the seconds number is a zero, then we've hit our 10 seconds and we go back to 120. And we'll remind us of that. 120 is where we set EC percent is to zero and then call the user value. We don't do the poke 785 and 786 again because that hasn't changed. There's no reason to keep doing it. So 900, yes, you predicted it. It is our end routine. So we've decided that we're going to close um, our two files, file two and file 15, and we end. And that's basically it. So let's run it and see what happens. Current time is 15.45, and I'll give it one second. So it's opened the file, and in fact, it's actually gone through. It's tried to open the file as a read, failed to open it as a read, and then opened it as a write, as an, sorry, as an append. So this number, 8193, 37. This is the number of times it fails the CRC test, which is interesting. Actually, it's no, it's not. It's the number of times it calls the routine. So the lowest that number will ever be is one. But you see this one, we had 37, 36 retries. And as a result, that took us three seconds. 34 retries, that took us two seconds. 16, that took us one second. But because we're doing it at um, every 10 seconds on the interval, then it's going to catch up. And we're getting nice clean values. We're not getting our silly numbers. So that's the one wire interface. Just warm it up in my hand and we'll start to see in 10 seconds more. Hopefully we'll see an increase. There we go, it's going up. Current thermometer temperature is, in fact, about 24. Oh, let's try that on there. Hopefully you can see that. It's a little bit cooler than yesterday because it is a Saturday. It is the weekend and so therefore it is raining. I guess there's a little bit of lag because it's now come up. Exciting, eh? So we can hit F7 and there we go. That's it done. Now the... Adafruit TMP36 sensor, which is this. Let's look at their web page. So it's a solid state sensor, determines temperature, obviously. So basically, it's a little solid state chip. It's in a TO92 uh, package, which is makes it look kind of like a transistor. So we can see from the pinout, it takes ground, analog out, and 2.7 to 5.5 volts in. So we can power it off 5 volt uh, supply. We need 5 volts and ground, and the third pin is the output. TO92 package, 
minus 40 to plus 150. Output range is 0 0.1 volts to 2 volts. OK, we can have a look at the pinout of a C64 joystick port. And I've got one of those here. We don't really want to worry about the digital. The analog inputs is pot AY, which is pin 5, and pot AX, which is pin 9. This is for control port 1. For control port 2, it would be pot B, Y and pot B, X. I believe joystick port 2 is shared with the keyboard, so we won't use that one. We'll use joystick port 1. So we've got pin 7 is plus 5 volts. Pin 8 is ground. Then we're going to have it in big. Why not have it in big? So it's these four here. That, 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 that. This is our power supply and these are our inputs. This should be very quick to wire up. We've got our connector, a little strip of Vera board or strip board, a ribbon cable. I've already tinned the ends just to make things quicker. And of course our sensor. And just for double checking I've got the pinout of the port on a piece of paper and I shall write down what colours I solder to what pins. So the reason for using a bit of strip board is so that we can wire that up and then put this into here. And also when we do the thermistor one, we can put that into here as well. And that's just going to make life a little bit easier. I hadn't thought of doing the thermistor one when I got all this other stuff. So I've had to order some thermistors and they won't arrive till tomorrow. But no matter. So 5 volts and ground are 7 and 8. I'm going to make 5 volts red because we always make 5 volts red. I shall make ground the brown one because it's nearest to black. Not a particularly logical reason, but it's better than no reason at all. I should really get some of those grippy hand things. If you have a recommendation for a good set of grippy hand things, then please say so in the comments below. Because I'm making a pig's ear of this. That defies horror. Because my soldering was so crap, I am going to test it. Okay, they're not shorted, that's good. There we go. And this will plug into the joystick like that. Don't pull it by the cable. Always remember, never pull by the cable. So at this end, I want them separated by one because the way that this is the pinout means the voltages are on the ends and the signal is in the middle. So that's how I want to organize this wiring. And then it's going to be a choice of yellow or orange. It doesn't really matter. One is going to be used for this sensor and the other was going to be used for the, th um, the other thing. So if you remember our little transistor -y thing, TN92 plus 5, 0, signal. So it goes in here like that. And let's just double check. Right, plus five signal ground. Plus five is red, signal is orange, 
brown is ground. That is correct. Weight it down with something. So let's clean up the desk, plug it in and see if we can take some measurements. Okay, here we go. Let's power it on. So the register that we are looking at for pin nine, which is the orange wire, is 54297. Okay, so let's check some voltages between there and there should be 5 volts, it is. Between there and there should be 0.7 volts approximately, it is. So that's working, we just need to get the value into the port. There's probably some setting up I need to do that I haven't done. Okay, some of you will be saying that it's the SID, it's the SID. Your analog to digital converters are not working. Well, I've taken the um, sensor off and put a little header on and I've hooked up between 5 volts and the orange sensor, the 500k resi um, resistor, or at 500k pot, and that should replicate the action of a paddle. And this is a little program because there's interaction between the keyboard uh, handling and the CIA and all this stuff, I have uh, written a little program, turns off IRQs, sets the uh, multiplexer thing that determines whether the paddle is going to be on port one or port two, because the SID only has one, sorry, the SID only has two analog to digital converters and they are going to be X and Y on one port or the other port. So then we read it and we re-enable the IRQs. And there you can see that we are getting a value of 228 across uh, the orange pin. And if we change the value of the pot and run it again, there we are. So that is definitely working and I've done it for both pins and they are both fine. So, it doesn't like whatever this thing does. It doesn't see it. It doesn't see it. Okay, so that experiment, for the moment at least, unless I figure out a way of doing it, is a failure. Let's go on to the next one. Our next two sensors are basically driven by the same interface. They're different devices, but they're driven in the same way. And that way is I squared C. So we need to learn a little bit about I squared C and how that works. And then we can talk to these devices and we'll talk to them in basically the same way. And once we can talk to these, we can talk to other I squared C devices, which in itself could be quite interesting. So let's have a quick primer on I squared C. I squared C, aka I2C or IIC, stands for Inter-Integrated Circuits, and it was invented in 1982. It's a two-wire interface, and the two wires are SCL and SDA, which stands for clock and data. Now, on an I squared C bus, there is a master and there are slaves. It's an open drain interface, which basically means that um, you don't apply a voltage to it. There are pull-ups to plus volts, and these are quite often found in the device itself. You'll actually see generally in an interface that it's a four-wire system like this. This is the Pimeroni BME280. And we have data and clock, but we also have ground and plus volts. Now, depending on the device, it could be either 5 volts or 3.3 volts. You need to check the device itself. And you'll see on this, hopefully, that it says 5 volts OK. So basically what I'm going to do, these have... Let's open them up and have a look. 
So this is a nice sealed thing. It comes with a a sort of cable that plugs in. And these holes are supposed to be Lego compatible, which is interesting. So maybe we will experiment with that. But I've got something that will plug into that and then um, plug into here. And this This says on the back of it, address is I squared C, address is 76 or 77. Now there's a little link there, so you can either cut the link and you'll get 77, or don't cut the link and you'll get 76. That just allows you to have two of these on the same bus. This has four wires, so why has this got five? And you'll see the little connectors that come with it have got five. And the reason for that is that this is designed so that it will directly plug into a Raspberry Pi. So one of those pins does nothing. And you can just literally plug that straight onto the top of a Raspberry Pi, onto the um, GPIO port, and you're good to go. But we're not going to do that because we are using a C64. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, connectors in for both of these, and it's going to go to pins 4 and 5. So the answer is yes, it does fit Lego. Not particularly impressive Lego, but it is Lego. So what I have done, I have decided arbitrarily that pin four is going to be clock and pin five is going to be data. So pin four is H and pin five is J, which is on the bottom, but they come through here. So I've made the clock green and the data blue. So I've got a four-way header here and a five-way header here with one pin missing. And the five-way header fits the Pi Maroni thing, which I've put another header onto here. So it goes like that, missing pin to missing pin. And this is a different pin out to this one. This one goes um, so clock, data, plus volts and ground and this one goes plus volts, clock, data, missing and ground. So it's important that we don't get them mixed up and that's why I went four pins and five pins so it's going to be easy to remember. And then with this, this is the wire that came with the kit and this is a little adapter that takes it to a regular sort of um, header cable. So that goes in there and this header cable then just goes onto the pin headers like that. So that's it. I'm a fairly simple wiring up and the other thing that I've done here just so that you can see it is I've laced a wire all the way along this edge here and that is a ground wire and then I've laced another wire starting from here all the way down to here and that is a 5 volts wire. Now one thing that we need to know about these is if you look on the back it says 5 volts OK and this one doesn't but the data sheet actually does say it's 5 volts OK. But you need to be aware that not every I squared C device actually works with 5 volts. Some of them are in fact 3.3 volts only. So you've got to be aware of that. And if it needs to be 3.3 volts, then you're going to need a buck converter or something to, to step down the voltage. Transmitting data on an I squared C bus. The clock is driven by the controller and data is registered on the rising edge of the clock. So that means that you should only change the data line while the clock is low. So clock is low, change the data, rise the clock, that latches the data into the device. And the important thing and why this is so useful for the Commodore 64 is that this runs at the speed of the controller. So it doesn't matter how fast this is, 
it's the controller that governs the speed, so it's the C64. There is a maximum speed depending on which particular I2C standard that you are using. Um, there's a maximum speed of 100 kilohertz for standard, 400 kilohertz for fast, 1 megahertz for fast plus, and 3.4 megahertz for high speed. Some of these devices will run at that top speed. Some of them may not. The C64 certainly will not. When we're composing data to send on the I2C bus, or we are um, preparing to receive data from the I2C bus, we transmit and receive what are called frames. And a frame is basically a logical block of data. So there is a start frame, there is a stop frame, and there are data frames. Now, I mentioned before that we only change the data while the clock is low, but a start frame occurs when the clock is high and you change data from high to low. And a stop frame occurs again when the clock is high and you change the data from low to high. There's another frame which is called a repeated start where you do a stop, so the line goes high, and then you do an immediate start, so the line goes low. But normal data transitions only occur while the clock is low. So when we're transmitting data, we transmit bytes of 8 bits, and we also have an ACK. So each byte of data is 9 clock cycles. And we transmit the data in the order of most significant bit first. So bit 7, bit 6, bit 5, bit 4, bit 3, bit 2, bit 1, bit 0. And then we have an ACK. And the ACK comes from the receiver. And an ACK is a 0, so it stays 0 and a NAC is a 1. And the default state, the default response to that, if there's nothing on the bus, is going to be a 1 because of those pull-ups. The BME280 from Pimeroni, by default it has an address of OX76, but there is a little jumper on the back, and with that jumper you can set it to OX77 by cutting the jumper. This means that you can have two of these on an I2C bus, because every device has to have a different address. So you can only set this to two addresses, so you can only have two of them. This little silver square here is the actual sensor, that is the BME280 IC. So we have a whole bunch of registers inside this device, which is just like on a SID chip or on a CIA chip. And register D0 is the ID, and that returns a fixed value of OX60, which is 96. If you don't get 96 back, then either the sensor is not attached, or it's attached and it's set to the wrong address or something. Before we can measure temperatures, we've got to get some calibration data from the device. Every device is set up at the factory with a table of calibration data, and that has to be applied to the raw numbers that you get back from the sensor to convert that into an actual temperature or a pressure or a humidity. So it's 33 bytes, and it starts from register 88 hex. And then we use this table of um, 33 bytes to calculate the compensated values from the raw sensor data. So when we want to read the sensor, we have to do two things first off. We have to enable each individual pressure, temperature, or humidity sensor. And we do that with a register write. And then we have to set forced mode. Forced mode means it's going to take one reading and then switch off. So forced mode, one shot, set this, because we only want to read the device, say, once a minute. And then we read once we set forced mode, it will automatically go away and read the sensors, and it will spend a little bit of time setting that data up, just like we saw with the other probe on the one wire. It will set that data up into its buffer and get it ready for us to read, but we are going to be so slow that it's going to be there by the time that we are ready to receive it. So we then read 8 bytes starting at register F7, and those are 
three bytes of pressure, three bytes of temperature, and two bytes of humidity. So that's a 20-bit value, that's a 20-bit value, and that's a 16-bit value. And then we can calculate the results. And that's basically it. So let's have a look at the program in action. So we're back at the C64. We've got the Pimeroni sensor plugged into the I squared C bus on the back. And let's just list the program. I'll let it scroll all the way through just so that you can appreciate the length. Never mind the functionality, look at the length. <laughs> there we go. 250 odd lines approximately. So from line 4000 onwards we have basically the I squared C um, driver. So from line 4000 or so we have the I squared C driver which you can extract. Actually I'll all the programs that I'm running here, I'm going to provide links to in the description, so you can download those and check them yourselves. I'll give you a, a .bas file as well as the tokenized version of the program, so that you can use it in um, CBM Prog Studio. So off we go. This is going to be a little bit slow actually running because, of course, it's in BASIC, and it, the um, Interface in BASIC is quite slow because you're doing pokes and peaks just to switch a bit on and off. And obviously you have to do that eight times for every byte. Without further ado, now the current time is 14.47. My watch doesn't have seconds, so I'll just put zero. We got the 60 back. Now we're getting the calibration data. So this actually is in three chunks. Um, <clears throat> 24 bytes starting at register 88. Then we have a byte at register A1. And then we have seven more bytes at register E1. And while I was talking to that, we did the sendy, sendy, sendy and receive. And this is our raw data and our compensated data. I'll show you the thermometer. Hopefully you can see that. It is about 28 degrees. So 28 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric pressure is 1008 hectopascals, which I translated that into inches for our American friends, and that's 29.78 inches of mercury. And relative humidity is 52.4%. It has been quite recently raining, so seems to be about right. This is going to do a measurement roughly once a minute. And the barometer, we can have a look at our local airfield online and that will tell us a calibrated pressure for something that is about five miles away. And I'll leave this running for a little bit, come back to it and we can see a series of readings that it's done over a bit of time. And here we've gone through a few more readings. You can see the temperature is slightly coming up. That is partly because I've put this onto the top of the C64 here and there is some heat coming through. So it's registering the heat from that. I'll take it off and it should start going down again. Relative humidity is starting to go down because the rain has finished. This is of course warmer than you'll see on the um, airfield temperature because we are measuring indoor temperature and in my office which is generally warm anyway because it's upstairs and it's hot in here. So the calculations to go from raw to compensated are basically given in the data sheet and you get the numbers out of the sensor as we did our 33 bytes and then you essentially you plug them into the formulas that they give and um, you have to convert them into CBM basic, obviously. But it's, uh, oh, there we go. So what that does, that one command send, um, turns on the humidity 
This command turns on the pressure and the temperature and sets the burst mode, sorry, and sets the forced mode and that reads the temperature, reads the pressure, reads the humidity and then we can get our 8 bytes which actually brings the data back. And that's the Pi Moroni BME 280. So now let's have a look at the EMV3 which is also a temperature, pressure and humidity sensor but this is actually two separate devices on the one bus. So we have to talk to this, we have to talk to one device and it's an SHT30 and the other device is a QMP6988 and they have their own addresses on the bus and they just happen to be in one package. But we can, using exactly the same principles, we can talk to these sensors and we can get something going. So let's do that. So this is the ENV3 and this has got two sensors in the one package. It's got an SHT30 and it's got a QMP6988. Now the SHT30, this is the simplest one. This does temperature and humidity. It's got an I squared C address of OX44, or you could set it to OX55. Programming it is slightly interesting, and we had to make some changes to the code to cope with this one. It's got no registers, and it, instead it has 16-bit commands. So instead of sending data to register 5, you send, for example, a 16-bit command F32D and that is get the status byte. This is instead of like read register five. It also has checksums. What that means is that when you get six bytes, it actually sends seven bytes. And the seventh byte is a checksum and you need to act the checksum. And it's a fairly simple checksum. So the code behind this is quite simple. We just send the F32D command that gets us the status byte and we can check that everything is fine. We then send 240B which is the read temperature and read humidity commands with a certain degree of repeatability or reliability. So that does the sample count and so on. And that returns six bytes so we just send the command and then read six bytes. And it's a fairly simple calculation to go from those six bytes to the actual values of temperature and humidity. The QMP6988 is a bit more of a traditional device in the sense it's got address of OX70 or an address of OX56, hardware settable. So I think maybe if on this, maybe you would have to take the device apart. So it has many registers like the BME280. It has a 24 byte compensation table. Remember the BME280 had a 33 byte compensation table. The values that we get back for temperature and pressure are 22 bits up to 24 bits, depending on what we have set for the reliability and repeatability and the number of samples. Then we have to calculate a human readable result. And the calculation for that is incredibly complicated and poorly documented. There are no code examples. There's no sample data. The example that you can find online bears no relation to the um, equations that are given in the data sheet. And well, we shall see what happens a bit later on. So that is the ENV3. Let's try it out. So let's have a quick look at the code. This is a longer program. It's about 450 odd lines. So we're not going to go through the whole thing. The I squared C stuff is more or less the same. I had to change it a bit to allow for sending commands that were 16 bits long and for not having registers. But the actual uh, you know, comms is the same. Slightly unfortunate name, the SHT30, but there we go. So new subroutine sends a two byte command. We're registering, registering. 
etc. The um, the program will be available in the comments so you can have a look yourself. Let's just run it. Time is 19.11. Right, so we're connected to the SHT30. We've got um, bytes back. We're also connected to device 70. So that is the, what's it called? QMP. So that's the QMP. This is doing it on a 10 second or so loop. So these are calculations that are intermediate because what we're what, <clears throat> there. So what we've got here at 1911.41, that's the current time. Temperature, this is from the SHT30, is 26.9 degrees Celsius. I'll show you the thermometer, that's about right. It shows about 25. It's approximately right, it's going to be a bit warmer because it's sitting on the top of the 64. So 26.9 Celsius, I've given you a conversion of that into Fahrenheit 80.4. I hope that's correct. My brain doesn't really work with Fahrenheit these days. I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments if that's wrong. So 26.9, 80.4, 27 now, 80.5. Humidity, 52.5. Now, you'll remember that I said that the QMP also does temperature. So I've calculated the temperature based on the QMP sensor and that comes back as 25.6, which is different. It's a concern, they don't match. And I'm inclined to believe the SHT rather than the QMP because when it comes to the pressure, you'll see that it's telling us that it's 23,400 hectopascals. Now that is an incredibly high pressure and I would imagine that we would be somewhere near the Titanic underwater for that kind of pressure. We would normally expect and indeed the barometer, if it will focus on that, the barometer is saying about 1009. And this is the problem that I've got with the um, QMP device. The documentation is quite frankly bloody awful. It gives a calculation which seems reasonable, multiply by this, multiply by this, multiply by this, that factor squared, that factor times that, times cubed. I'll show, I'll show you it on the screen. And that sort of seems reasonable except it gives that bloody answer, which is quite clearly wrong. So I searched the web for some examples. There's no example in the manual, unlike the um, unlike the BMP 280, which had three wonderful examples of how to do the calculations for um, different processor consi considerations. There was a, a floating point version. There was a 32-bit integer version. There was a 64-bit integer version. Um, there's not an 8-bit integer version, which is what we would want, but never mind. The floating point version would worked fine on the BMP 280. In fact, you saw it, it gave very good results. The documentation does not say whether, for example, the values that come back are signed or unsigned. It doesn't give an example. Um, so you've got no way of knowing how to... Um, how to judge whether what you've got is correct. You don't know whether the parameters that you've got back are supposed to be signed. And the only program version that I could find, which was ironically the Arduino library driver, that's not a floating point calculation. That is a 64-bit integer calculation. And it doesn't really translate to the C64. I tried it. I tried it byte for byte, word for word, digit for digit, and it produces incredibly crazy wrong results. So yeah, that's not gonna fly. So 
yeah, partial success, I would say. But, you know, quite frankly, if, you, if you've got a choice between the BME 280 and the ENV3, I would say every time use the BME 280. It's a much better and much more, um, much more friendly sensor, a lot more easy to program. And the examples and the documentation are so much better. Okay, onwards and upwards. Let's get back to the wonderful world of the joystick port and the other use for the SID chip. The TMP36 is basically no go. The reason being that this is not a resistive device. So not today, sadly, but what we do have is this. This is a thermistor, which is basically a temperature dependent resistor. It's nominally 100K. And this particular one is a spare part for my 3D printer, which is why it comes pre-soldered to this nice long wire doo -doo 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 -doo, with a little connector on the end. So that is going to save us the effort of soldering this little device up to some sort of connector. And what we need to do is basically just to remind ourselves So we want to connect our little thermistor between that and that. I'm not entirely sure what the symbol is for a thermistor. We'll just draw a splodge. And also a one mega ohm resistor. And surprisingly enough, I have a one mega ohm resistor here in my little pot labeled one meg. And then we can write a little program to read that. This can go into the joystick and we can turn on the C64 and write some code. So we need a little bit of basic in order to get a reading from this and convert it into a temperature. So it's only a short program. That's a bit low. From running the other program, we know the temperature in the room is about 25 and a half, 25.5. So let's just adjust our V2 a little bit. Let's make that for 70. Wrong way round, silly boy. My brain is going backwards. That's probably close enough, 25.5 ish. A little bit of jitter. So if I stick my hand on this, we can see that it goes up. Take my hand away. And it's coming back down. Okay, so we've done our set of measuring devices. We've done the um, waterproof sensor, single wire. We've done the Pimeroni, BME 280. We've done the little ENV3 Lego thing. And we've also done the thermistor on the joystick port. So, 
one more thing. To round it all off, I got one of these. They cost about a fiver for two on Amazon. And what it is, is a thing called a TM1637. That's basically the chip on the back. It's a four digit display and it looks like an I squared C. Now, looks can be deceptive and it doesn't actually say on the website that it is an I squared C, but it isn't. It has the same pins, ground, VCC, uh, clock and data, but it's driven in a slightly different way and also it's driven backwards. So with I squared C, with these devices, then you send and receive the most significant bit first. So bit seven, then bit six, then bit five, then finally bit zero. With this, and it took me several days of uh, frustration to find this out, but this is, if you like, little endian compared to these things being big endian. So you send bit zero first, then bit one, then bit two, then bit three. So it's basically, it's backwards. It also doesn't do addressing like um, I squared C devices do. So you can only have one of these on. It's not really a bus. Anyhow, it's a seven segment four digit display. So I figured why not take this and display on it the temperature that we're reading from these thermometers. So here's what I've set up earlier. Basically, it's plugged in four wires I squared C bus. It's wired up almost the same, five volts and ground. Make sure the brown and brown and red on the interface. Um, it's exactly the same as this, as this I squared C interface in terms of wiring. And I've taken it to pins uh, two and three on the user port, or, or at least PB2 and PB3 on the user port, which is, I believe, E and F. So, because this doesn't have addresses, whatever you send on the bus goes to this. And regardless of, of whether um, it's what you intend for it, so it can't really sit on the same bus as um, this one. So, fortunately, we can drive two things on the bus because we've got more than two pins. And so we can still measure the temperature and display it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this, to this, which is the single wire, the one wire interface that we started off with um, from Joseph's Retro Bits. And we're going to use that, read the temperature of this and display it on this. So let's run it and see what happens. So we need the current time. It's getting on a bit. It's 2200. That's 10 p.m. to you. File exists. That's because it's already written a disk file on here. It's basically going to just append now. So 24.6. There it is. I've sped it up. It's not actually every 10 seconds. It's just going straight around the loop. And because the temperature is pretty stable, it's not going to do very much. So we can just rest that on there. That should detect the warmth of the C64. We can see on here it's going up. It takes a little time to send it to the display because of course it has to send it a bit at a time and it's in basic. What you're not really seeing is it's writing each individual, well, you saw the six and the zero change, but that's the kind of speed it goes at. So because this is a waterproof sensor, I have got a nice strong Brownian motion generator. Ah, cheers. And we can see, oops, can I pick this up properly? Remember this is waterproof. The other sensors that we've got here are not waterproof. We 
you can see this going up 44 50 for some reason it seems to round the last digit slightly differently when it's going onto the display um, I guess that's a quirk of the int function 54 it's not straight out of the kettle but it's been sitting here a few minutes 55 55.7 it's going up it's coming down I think that's as high as we're going to get 55.7 it went up to and of course that will come down again so if you've got this far thank you so much for watching I had an idea and you can see there's I've put a header on there um, for it to try and make it display one of these not sure if you can see that doesn't particularly want to focus this is the IS31FL 3741 catchy name which is a 13 by 9 RGB panel. This, of course, it's named after the IC. This is I squared C, but I have not so far managed to actually get it to work. I can talk to it. I can um, send data to all the registers. I can set up patterns on the LEDs. I can. The one thing that I can't do is switch it on. So there's a um, a single bit flag that is basically the enable flag that turns the LEDs on and off and that one LED I cannot or rather that one register I cannot get it to set I don't know why I've put out inquiries on a couple of discords not really got any results back so if you happen to be an I squared C bus expert and you think ah I know why that is remember it's being programmed with 5 volt logic and which it should cope with and in basic which maybe it can't anyhow the code that I've got so far I'll put a link to that in the description below so if you think you can get it to work then please feel free to have a look at it the same goes for the code for all these other sensors that will all be linked in the description below but that's it I think for this video we're down to 28.8 degrees. If there are any machine language experts out there that want to have a go at converting this to assembly slash um, 6502 machine language, then please feel free. The code is in the, um, the basic code is in the comments. Uh, it would be interesting to see how much faster it can go in machine language. And maybe this um, display would work if there was a machine language driver for it. Anyhow, thank you for watching and like and subscribe and all the usual uh, stuff if you want to. Um, if you've enjoyed it, give me a like, give me a subscribe. If you haven't, then um, and you watched this far, then thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. See ya. And the calculation for that is incredibly complicated. And the calculation for that is incredibly complicated.